So welcome everybody, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, the purpose of this is actually to uh, shed some light on this topic of OD or organisational development. And uh, I've intentionally sort of think it's worth calling demystifying because uh, we did a webinar, sorry, a podcast about six months ago. Um, some of you may or may not know that I host a podcast called the HR Uprising and this is one of our original topics and uh, it was one of the most downloaded which made us realise it's definitely something uh, to share more about. So the purpose of this, it won't take longer than 30 minutes. If you have any questions as we go through it, please feel free to type them in the comments um, and I will come back and answer them and I'll also um, touch on a couple of questions that were asked last week on the webinar, as I say, that it was oversubscribed, so I'll pick up on those as well. So my name is Lucinda and um, I'll introduce myself fully in a moment, but let me just explain what I'm hoping to cover over the course of this webinar. So obviously we're going to define what we mean by organisational development. Then we're going to look at what's the difference between OD, HR and learning and development, because I think it's that overlap that often causes confusion. What topics fall into OD and what would you say are HR or L&D or are they all interlinked? We'll look at some real examples and then we'll just touch on how we can all bring more OD into our practice if we want to. My name I say, is Lucinda Carney. I'm a chartered psychologist and I've had a, a number of years of internal corporate learning and development roles. So actually they were called learning and development, but a lot of what I did was organisational development. I think I knew that at the time because I, um, I'm a chartered psychologist, so I did a, a first degree and a second degree in organisational psychology, which is pretty much the study of OD. And at that time, I know, and I'll share a story with you in a moment about um, what people thought when I left, uh, as no one understood what the term OD was. So you tended to be, if, even if you were doing OD activities, sitting into L&D or into HR. Um, I also run now, or I, I now run a software business, um, Actors Performance Management Software, and as I mentioned earlier, I host uh, the HR Uprising podcast. So we are on about our 42nd episode. If you haven't found that, you may well enjoy it because there's quite a lot of very relevant topics, and also we do respond to suggestions if there's topics that you're after. Um, I am a mum of two kids and uh, two teenagers now and uh, a keen but very average netball player, but I do like to follow netball as well. I was watching England play yes, on, on Sunday. So those are all my details there. If anyone wants to contact me directly, please feel free and I'll put those up again at the end. So when we're talking about organisational development or OD, what do we mean by that? Um, and I said I'd allude to a, a story that uh, when I first set up on my own, I set up as a consultant, an organisational development consultant, and the business I set up was called Advanced Change, and I called myself an OD consultant. And I lost count of the number of people who asked me what an odd consultant was. Now, you might cast it, might some um, aspersions about my, uh, my behaviour and being slightly odd, some may say that, but it helped me understand how much in the, well, actually even within our profession, people don't really know what it's meant by it, uh, but certainly in the broader terminology, people really have never, no clue what we mean by OD. So maybe we need to educate people because it's actually very, very important. The CIPD, um, they define OD as being a planned and systematic approach to enabling sustained organisational performance through the involvement of its people. So we can see it's about the organisation and its people. So obviously it's going to start involving HR and learning and development. Ruffy Park, and I don't know if you've come across Ruffy Park, this management institute, I think they are really excellent specialists in OD. And a number of years ago, I went on a great one day OD course there. So if you want to know more about it, I would check out their website. And I think the link's at the end of my slides. So they're saying it's about facilitating organizational um, success by aligning structures, cultures, and strategic realities of work in response to business climate. So they're introducing more about structure and culture and responding um, to the business requirement, which I think is really important. My take is it's about evolving, adapting or improving an organisation in line with its strategic goals. So what I'm trying to bring in here is it is about the business environment, whatever we're doing, if we're doing OD, we need to be aligning it with the business requirements. And also very often it involves change or transformation. So hopefully those make sense. Then um, I thought I'd, I'd float a, a, a sort of philosophical question. And I guess if you're thinking, I'll ask it to you as you're thinking, whereabouts should OD sit in an organisation? 
if you have an opinion, feel free to type it in the comments box. Do you think it should sit under HR? Do you think it should sit um, under learning and development? Do you think it should sit above them both or on the board table? I mean, I don't think there's a right answer. However, I often thought about it that very, where I do see OD roles, and it's not actually in all that many businesses, or no, in fact, it's not in that many businesses. I do see it in the NHS and public sector more so. Um, and it would tend to sit under HR is where I see it. However, philosophically, I wonder whether actually OD should sit above HR and learning and development. And then you would also have even things like business improvement. So in one of the businesses I worked in, you did have this area called business improvement where they looked at more sort of business process re-engineering and lean initiatives and those sort of things. Um, and, and I just thought because it's actually something which is sitting across the whole organization. Now, clearly, we're millions of miles away from that ever happening and it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but I think that what that explains is it can have overlaps into our roles. It's something that there's almost a Venn diagram between OD, HR and learning development, in my opinion. So just let me move this next slide on. These are, I say it's quite a broad topic. These are some of the topics that I would expect to be captured as OD topics. And I say some of you, I'm not sure. In fact, if anyone, wants to, I can see I've got a few of you on here, actually. Um, maybe just let me know what your roles are, um, whether you sit in an OD role officially. Last time I had quite a few OD people. Um, or are you HR or learning and development? Just type into the comment box. I won't name you, but I'll just keep an eye on that as I run through this slide. It'd be useful to know. Ah, here we go. So I've got I've got an OD lead here who can probably take this webinar for me. So these are the topics. Then I'm hoping if you put OD D lead that these would fit within your your role in your view. Great. Okay. So I can see I've got OD, I've got L and D and HR coming through. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, I would see that organizational structure and design that could definitely fit within OD. Now, I do see that you have workforce planning roles in HR sometimes. So I would say that could arguably be an OD type role um, in leadership man, leadership roles. What I'm looking at here is an OD might look an OD role might be about looking at what are our leadership and management systems and processes. So what is our performance management process? What is our reward process? Um, maybe what is our, um, not so much onboarding because that would probably be more specialist, but um, what's our process for developing high potentials? So that's where it might become um, more OD and it also might be where we're looking at, if I look at strategic talent management on the other side, is where we might look at what the requirements of the organisation are strategically, where we have gaps or where as an organisation we need to develop our capability and we might want to recruit or develop people against it. So the OD hat is almost looking at that requirement and helping us to look as a, at the, the organisation as a whole as to what's required in order to solve that. However, then I would say if you're in learning and development, you're the person who's going to be designing those leadership and management development programmes, that talent management training courses, or if you're in HR, you might be putting in place incentive schemes or systems and processes that support these. So HR and learning and development, I think, bring it to life and also turn things into business as usual, whereas the OD aspect of that is about the defining and making sure that it fits with where the business is going. That, of course, then leads into things like culture and change. And I think that is something that does naturally sit as a differentiator, possibly. Uh, if you end up in a transformation role, that is definitely an organisational development role. It is going to involve change. It is going to involve um, looking at cultural aspects of your organisation and how you're going to develop that as well. Of course, continuous improvement and learning. So, you know, I had an L&D hat uh, when I was employed. So I certainly would have been looking at continuous improvement from a business point of view and an individual point of view. But as I say, the organisation I was in had a business improvement role, which was more about how the business learnt from uh, things that it had done. It was less about people or human learning. It was more about business improvement, as is said in the title. And I think that is OD too. Um, and then being evidence-based, there's quite a lot now. The CIPD is emphasising evidence-based practice. More and more um, organisations are saying, actually, we need to be better at um, 
just being considered in our approach and certainly OD would be about looking around for the evidence as to why something needs to change or why we think we have a requirement um, and gathering the best evidence that we can within an organisation and then implementing this systematically and then assessing whether or not it's been effective. So it is quite a considered, it's not a tactical, it's much more a considered strategic um, approach to delivering delivering change in your organisation or developing the organisation. To bring this slide further, I think it's always helpful to have examples. I'm a, a, an example lover. So I've stolen some from Roffey Park, actually, initially, and then I'll take you through some of my own. There we go. So these are examples here where um, Roffey Park said, so you're doing OD if you're changing the structure, culture, strategy or processes either from an individual role through to an entire organisation. So that's broad enough if you haven't <laughs> thought about that. Um, behavioural science is basically evidence-based or it's psychology. So it's, it's application of behavioural science knowledge in order to deliver transformation. So that's being evidence-based in our practice. It's about thinking about how the organisation could be more effective. So that's about taking a step back and analysing the effectiveness of the organisation and maybe running activities with other people. So uh, diagnosing the organisation, but involving others. So you might be like doing focus groups or we've done things like world cafes and there's lots of different ways in which we might or interviewing people to understand um, the organisation. And that's about gathering evidence of the fact that anything needs to change in the first place, rather than just using intuition. Or if the board have said, we need to change, it's actually gathering evidence for that viewpoint. Uh, so that we can be sure that when we've made that change, it's, we're, we're working on something real and not just spin. It's about uh, delivering pr and promoting high productivity, um, performance quality. It is about the best, looking for the be being the best that we can as an organisation. It's about facilitating change and being flexible, adaptive and often participative. So that's one of the things where, again, I think we it works really well if, often if we've got HR or L&D skills as well, because it's about involving people. It's not about doing change to people. It's about taking people on that change journey. And it needs to be sustainable. So it's about doing stuff well and embedding it well. So it is, it's very much doing a professional job of developing change as opposed to just something tactical. Now, this is five steps for delivering an OD intervention. I was like the intervention word, which is often uh, used in these circumstances. It makes me think we're staging an intervention for somebody. Um, but let's look at this. These five steps are really, really common sense. But it's just good to remind yourself if you are involved in change or implementing, which is OD, because often we find that we are juggling multiple projects or activities and the problem with that is sometimes something we've started doesn't get embedded properly we don't get chance to evaluate it so it's always good to remember have I been through all of these steps so very simply we our first step is actually let's work out do we need this so we need to make step a links between our future strategy and if we need any potential changes and if we think we do we need to therefore gain buy-in from the senior leadership team that we are going to implement those changes because we're going to need their support we need to ensure that we have reasonable evidence for the need to change. And that's what I was talking about earlier. So that might be uh, interviewing people. It might be looking at uh, people's productivity in certain areas or attrition rates. It's looking at what information that you have within your organization and possibly looking at benchmarks externally. Once you get that evidence, you'll be kept coming up with some metrics. And the, the great thing about that is you can then use those metrics as a benchmark to whether or not you've been successful in making any change as well. So you can review those later. If you don't start with something like that, it's really hard to evidence in any way that's objective that you've been successful. We then choose our intervention um, and I've got a list of what I mean by intervention. So whatever it is we're going to do, whether it's a management development program, whether it's a process change, um, whether it's a competency framework, we start small and I would say start small and try not to do too many things at once. Try and see one thing through unless they're all, unless it all have to be interlinked. See one thing through, be realistic about delivering that and then go to the next stage. Once you've done that, it's going on to implementing the plan and seeing it through. This is very, very obvious, but very difficult. And also, if you're someone who likes change, often you like to move on to the next thing. So it's making sure that whatever you started does get finished. And then of course, evaluate, was it successful? To what degree was it successful? Share that impact with your 
stakeholders and sponsors and decide what you're going to do next. So it's an iterative program, but you're getting continually better. You can't see me waving my arms around in circles. You're getting better as opposed to getting continually going down because things aren't finished. So the sorts of things that might sit within OD is maybe OD interventions or the tools that we might use um, or the topics that could fall in here. And I know that given the people I've got on the call, some of you go, oh, like that actually fits within learning and development or that is HR. Um, yeah, that's in my area. So lots of these things that you might use. So I can see things like World Cafe and focus groups I like as examples of gathering information from people. You might do interviews with people and these don't have to be, uh, this could be people who are in their job interviews. You might want to do talent planning or talent management, uh, which would then lead to leadership development or high performance um, development. So there might be a whole load of development which link to OD because you're developing uh, people in line with a, an overall strategic requirement. Culture, so terms like the cultural web, systems thinking, a lot of these sort of things are complexity theory, they're all they're all sort of sort types of thinking, even positive psychology are ways of thinking which lead to things like a, a style of coaching or a, or a cultural impact um, in some way. So people might use appreciative inquiry as, as a positive way of understanding an organisation. I'm not saying that any of these are right or wrong, they are just all bits of jargon or things you can go and Google or find out about um, that might fit into uh, something you might call OD. And I've put in here there those examples like Lean and Six Sigma, which would be more like about the real sort of developing the organization's processes, which I also think um, sits business improvement is a sort of ancillary to OD. So those are sort of names. Berkeley Twin Model, that was one that I came across when I did the Roffey Park one day. And it's a really interesting model of high performance, how you can um, build in high performance practices. And it's an OD model um, and structure, which you could look up, which is quite nice. So just moving on, I wanted to try and clarify it further. And this is my take on this. And, I, and by all means, challenge me. Uh, I'm seeing that we overlap, but there's slight differences. So if I'm doing OD, I would say that I would be diagnosing and defining the new skills that are needed to support the business strategy. If I'm in HR recruitment, it's my job to recruit people with the right skills to fulfill this. Or if I'm a learning development, it might be about you know enabling people, giving people the giving people the training that's going to give them the right skills to fulfil this. OD, if I am helping the organisation to define a set of values or strategic goals or their vision and mission, that might be an OD, helping to define it to set it up. If I'm an HR or OD, then I'm more about to be embedding the way in which we might want to put, uh, if we want to, let's say, put values within our um, people to live the values, we might embed them within our performance management activities through um, assessing people through values and behaviours or giving them feedback against them. I'll just pick a couple of others because I'm sure you can read these yourself and obviously you can have the size if it's helpful. Um, so defining the new behaviours to support a culture change, that's the definition of them, but helping people to take on those changes or those behaviours is more of an L&D approach. Defining a strategy for talent and retention might be more OD, but actually identifying and monitoring our patterns of retention or attrition and whether or not people are taking up that development is more HR L&D. It's making it happen, it's bringing it to life, it's monitoring it, it's managing it um, on a longer term, term way. And then one more, but let's have a look at, uh, so I might want to look at behavioural science and best practice to try and define the best solution for a situation. If I'm in HR, I have to make sure that I'm looking at the legalities, the realities, and I'm enforcing policies that are going to protect the organisation would be one way which would sit quite specifically in HR rather than OD. So I'm hoping that those are quite sensible to you and starting to feel that there is a bit of a difference and then it's less obvious. So my summary slide here, and if you've got any questions, feel free to start typing them in. And actually, Helen, if you wanted to pop in the questions that we had from last week, maybe I'll summarise those here. Um, so top, pop in any questions you've got while I just summarise this slide. So I would say if we want to be more OD, whatever our, our role is, is making sure that our operational activities are definitely connected and supporting the future vision. It's about making sure that we are balancing the short term 
with the longer term because often we can get stuck very much in the sort of tactical day-to-day -day activities and missing that longer term always try and connect all activities with the business strategy to be perfectly honest i think that's something that we should do whether we're in hr learning de development or in organizational development so it's quite it's very much about thinking are we strategic are we future proofed um, if you're trying to get people to do things um, or to buy into a change, help them understand why it's important, again, by making that connection with the business strategy, because that is much more likely to take them with you. I think OD is pretty much the custodian of culture. And let's face it, that is no small ask. Culture comes from leadership. It comes from uh, historic behaviours. Um, in one or two individuals can impact culture. So it's quite a tricky one, but I think it's definitely something that we know. They say culture can eat strategy for breakfast, I think is the quote. So certainly if you're wanting to drive the right behaviors and culture in your organization, that is quite um, a key OD initiative. And I say, try to be systematic, alert to the evidence and finish. See through what you start. OK, so I have got a smaller group here, so that's fine. I've not had any questions from anyone, but do feel free to type in if you want to. I will just mention the ones I'm just checking. I haven't. I can't see any. Helen's just put the ones we had last week. Um, we had a question last week, which is how does OD interact with job design and well-being? Um, I had to think about that for a minute. And I think uh, my take is that job design is an OD activity. I said I mentioned earlier about almost workforce planning. It's about making sure that we've got the right roles defined um, in order to meet the current and future needs of the organization. Well-being, well, I think it's about engagement. It's often an output of how people are managed. So, so how you do that, there are many ways in which well-being is driven. Often it's about how people are managed. Um, so that's about the skills of your leaders. Uh, I, I, so I see that as something that it, it depends whether we identify that we have a, a, an overall well-being issue or something to, to change or whether or not it's something that we want to, um, that, that's actually something we just want to bring in an initiative, in which case it could sit elsewhere in the organisation. Uh, and anyone who has a different view, feel free. And we also said, does employee engagement sit under OD or HR? Um, and I think both, and of course it depends where OD sits. I think the whole concept of employee engagement is an out, um, employee engagement is very much an output generally, um, which has various impacts on an organization that you can measure. It will impact on job satisfaction, it will impact on productivity, it will impact on attrition. And the measuring and monitoring of that might sit within HR. The If you do something where you have a survey and people have to put in place training or changes, that might be facilitated by L&D or by OD. Um, but actually the concept of actually, what do we need to do strategically to improve employee engagement, that might be a change in initiative. There might be a series of activities. We might decide to put um, a performance management process in place um, or a recognition process in place to improve engagement. And that would be probably an overlap there in my mind between OD and engagement. So I'll just have a look and see if we've got any other questions. Do feel free to type them in if you'd like to. And I can't see any others, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording and, oh, that, in fact, let me just put my slides up and the links. Um, here's our further contact details, which are available to you. We'll make a point of just sending the slides out to everybody who's on the call anyway, um, because you've got them there and there's the links to the podcasts. Do please listen to the podcast if you're interested. And if you found this useful or you'd like to listen to a, a future webinar, we do run them monthly. Uh, next month's webinar is building your talent management strategy. So feel 